Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday Night Rheumatology, the Grand Round Series. We're going to continue what we started a few weeks ago. You've all survived um, March Madness, also known as COVID-19. Uh, and we've put forward a few good lectures, a, good few, a few good uh, sessions so far. And now we're going to go to um, our real um, key opinion leaders, our real educators in the area. Um, I don't know about you in the past week and how you've done, but what I'm seeing uh, in clinic uh, and in rheumatology is it's getting a little better. You know, I think I can remember hearing Alvin, our speaker, Alvin Wells, talking about this at um, RWCS conference in, in uh, February. And he gave this, you know, sort of brand new lecture on uh, telemedicine and telehealth and telerheumatology, and it seemed so far fetched. <laughs> uh, and we got into this, you know, by um, uh, oh, the hard way, um, and suddenly in March, and it's getting easier as we go along. Uh, I think we're getting smarter as we manage uh, difficult patients remotely. We're getting smarter as we manage all of that in the context of what is a, an epidemic um, that's greatly affected all of your lives um, and the lives of our patients. But we're gonna continue with this Grand Round series. It's also known as um, Rheumatologists with Good Haircuts. I got a good haircut this week. Um, and I'm gonna introduce my good friend, Dr. Alvin Wells, who also doesn't have to worry about a good haircut. Hey, That's Alvin. That's right. <laughs> hey, Jack, how are you? Okay, Alvin is from the Aurora uh, Rheumatology and Immunotherapy Center in Franklin, Wisconsin. He's got a lot of academic affiliations. He has a lot of expertise in a lot of areas. Alvin, I was just talking to you today about, I don't know what to do with pan uveitis <laughs> and what it fails at TNF and they were call Alvin Wells. So that's, right. that's another lecture, another day, but right now you're wearing your, your, your Telerum with Hotology hat. I wanna inform the audience that if you haven't been following Alvin on Room Now, you've been missing out. And this series is an extension of what we've done thus far. So at Room Now Live, uh, um, nearly a month ago, he gave a 15 minute TED talk about telemedicine and where, why it belongs in your arsenal and how far it's come. And it was really a, a bold invite for all of us to say, you know, to take this on. And little did we know, it really did happen like soon thereafter. And then he's done, been really gracious in doing three other interviews with us to take us one step further, one step further. So he's got a series going and we're pretty much gonna give him his own website and channel soon. So this- <laughs> That's right. So this, this lecture, Alvin, is going to be um, telehealth and, um, and telemedicine and moving forward. I, I'm going to turn the screen over to Alvin and let him take it from here. Stick around, folks. We're going to do Q&A at the end, okay? Perfect. And thank you, Jack, for all those nice, um, kind words. Um, I tell you, I think this is, like you said, it's a whole new world for us in telemedicine. I go back until about six years ago. I started with a company called HealthTep. Uh, I was reading and stuff, and what do I do to increase revenue of my clinic? And I saw that, hey, you can sign up, you can see patients and do that remotely. I did that for a couple of years, and after that, I joined the, uh, with a, a group called American Well and learned how to do that and do these consults, and then moved over to uh, last year when we converted over to Epic with my group and began to use Zoom. So the purpose of tonight's talk, I thought, and Jack said, hey, about 30 minutes, take us through so where we are now and where we headed. And I really would encourage people to stay to the end because we're going to challenge you. I'm going to give you some bold statements about where I think the future of not only rheumatology, but also what medicine would be. So moving forward with telemedicine. A couple of introductory slides, you kind of see all these things. So telemedicine, what is it? And again, whatever kind of uh, uh, view you want to have, medical records, these applications, remote access, uh, personal medical records, all those things play into this. And this is a slide we do, and some of these things we'll, I'll come back to, we get from the American Telemedicine Association. But telemedicine, virtual medicine, telehealth, telerheumatology, whatever acronym you want to use, it says the same thing here. And essentially is the use of medical information that's exchanged from one site to another by electronic means. And here's a caveat, everybody got all excited and got all concerned, hey, do I need to do this all the way? The take home message, this is to improve patient health. It's not to apply, replace processes that are already in existence. There's, there's some systems that are synchronous in real time like we do on tonight. I'm connected with the patient, I see them real time. Others which is asynchronous, that's more for radiologists 
hey, if somebody gets an a, a MRI in Arizona, I can read that in my office in radiology in Chicago, so that's stored and shared for it. It is to enhance processes and not to replace them. Because at the end of the day, I like the breakdown here, 80% is you, it's the physician, it's the physician assistant, it's your nurse practitioner, it's your medical assistant and your nurse. 15% is the logistics. Do my MA check them in first? Do I have them scheduled in advance? Can I see them the same day? And only 5% is the technology. Am I using DoxyMe? Am I using American Well? Am I using all those different things? So I want you to keep in mind to improve the patient health because I can, can tell you that if you're using telehealth and tele-rheumatology, it's gonna be um, uh, important for us to kind of show, hey, what the outcomes look like. Uh, I'm a member of the American Medical Association. They have another system they call Steps Forward. They also, if you're a member there, you can look at their website. And again, as you embrace uh, telemedicine, again, to enhance wellness, to chronic disease management, and that's rheumatologists, 90% of what we do, enable access. And this is something that's been opened up with this whole COVID-19 crisis. Improve efficiency. And at the end of the day, look at talk about patient safety. So as you look at all these buzzwords, enhance, improve, increase, that's what we are. There's no such thing as replace. It's not gonna replace my vi my day-to-day -day visits. It's not gonna replace my hands-on visits. And I think that's what some rheumatologists were concerned about that. And at the end of the day, we have data for the next talk. I won't talk about that. So maybe Jack will have me that back when we can talk about outcomes. But telemedicine has definitely reduced morbidity and mortality, whether I'm looking at hypertension, congestive heart failure, diabetes, improved patient outcomes. A patient gets discharged from the hospital, somebody connects with them remotely, say, hey, Mrs. Smith, were you able to fill that medication? Did you indeed take your biologic medication? And not wait until they come back four months from now and say, well, I didn't get that medicine filled, and now they got deformities of their hands. And at the end of the day, overall, it's gonna lower the overall cost. So you wanna keep people out of the hospitals, out of the emergency rooms, and we can see that's going where the cost savings come in as well. Now, moving forward, this is going to be my buzzword tonight. It's going to be moving forward. We will still need telemedicine. And these are some data we talk about. These are old, but going back for a few years ago, looking at the shortage of the, of the U.S. Uh, you talk about primary care doctors, and in some of these are numbers where there's over 30% of, of patients where there's a shortage, uh, states rather, where there's a shortage. Now, over here on the right, we talk about, hey, where there's a, a greater demand, there is a uh, supply. So right here where I am, Illinois, Wisconsin, you look at all these par parts of the U.S., Again, we don't have enough doctors to cover uh, the supply. One of the other things we say in moving forward is that again, we know that a lot of doctors here are thinking about retiring. Now, unfortunately, one of the things that's coming out of this COVID crisis is some doctors say, hey, now it's time for me to hang up my shingles. This is just too overwhelming. Unfortunately, some practice is not gonna survive even despite the aid that's coming from the federal government. But look at doctors who think about retiring. Those that say, I'm gonna keep where we are. I'm not gonna change any things. Maybe I retire a little bit early. I say, I want to cut back my hours. And again, if you go around primary care, you can see people retiring, but look at the specialists. I have one other slide that kind of highlights it even more. Look at all the different specialties. You talk about, hey, internal medicine is probably okay in pediatrics, but most of our specialties is rheumatology and pulmonary disease. You're going to see a lot of people are going to be retiring. We will still need telemedicine. That means that, hey, if I can't now see a patient uh, in Illinois, but what about if somebody's retired, there's no access of patients, at, uh, physicians, or rheumatology, whether in, in Wisconsin, the Michigan, the Indiana, surrounding states. I look at this slide and you say, wow, this is thought this was years ago, but this is the, the workforce project that was uh, came out in 2015 by the ACR and American Medical Association. And it's a project to say at the 2015, that this year in 2020, that we would need up here at the top 6,796 6, rheumatologists, but we only have 4,400. And not too far away, guys, less than five years from now, we're gonna need 7,500 rheumatologists, we're gonna have about 3,600. So we're gonna see what that need is gonna be. So that means, hey, that now from your clinic, wherever you're practicing in California, you might say, hey, I can reach out to a patient indeed from another state, and we'll talk about what those guidelines are. So now here's a very intriguing thing. Like I said, I'm gonna be provocative tonight. So we talk about this, every patient need a physical exam. So I went through my database, I searched on Epic, I said, give me my 20 top di diagnoses, and this was what came out. So I created this word slide, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, you know, the things we hate to see, the Lyme disease, back pain, fibromyalgia, all those things come on the list. Now, when you think about those disease entities, how many of those people need a, a physical exam? So the question is, who needs a physical exam? Everybody. There is everybody. So the big question is how frequently do they need to do the exam? 
Is it a next exam? Do I need to do it just for my follow-up? Or what about my urgent care or acute visits? Uh, as many of you know, I train in Sweden. I speak Swedish. I usually go to the hospital every year uh, to Stockholm. This year, my plans have been thwarted by the COVID-19 crisis. They are struggling just like we are here in the U.S. But at Karolinska in Stockholm, they have whatever disease, if a patient's in low disease activity or remission, that patient's only seen once a year. They have a centralized lab, so labs are done. They have a centralized pharmacy, so drugs are, are dispensed. They have a way to track if somebody does get an infection while on a biologic, et cetera, et cetera. So does everybody need a physical exam? Here's the challenging part. What about the disease state? So on my word slide, I had osteoarthritis. So that 80-year-old lady with herbinins and Bouchard's nodules, I'm not gonna do a whole lot for that. I'm gonna keep on some topical NSAIDs, maybe some Tylenol, uh, maybe a little Tramadol to have. A gout, a gout, unless the patient's having a flare, they're stable, only one flare a year, I might only need to see them once a year to make sure their labs and everything else are okay. Many of my colleagues hate fibromyalgia. We get stuck with the patients because we got the, came up with the diagnostic criteria. There are indeed three FDA approved drugs that we can use. But the question is, hey, who, who, how often do we need to see them in the clinic? If they had their way, they would want to be seen every month. And then the back pain. I work closely with the pain doctors, but again, they don't treat or manage pain. They only do the injections and procedures. So these are just four that I picked on to say, hey, indeed, if they're being seen by a rheumatology practice, and if you're not seeing these, again, um, I don't know how many people are surviving because these are sometimes the bread and butter patients, but we push back and get through. So they might only be seen once or twice a year for an examination. And then the question comes up, an examination by whom? Now, many of you might have seen this data that we did with the T-Red group a few years ago for the ACR. I haven't seen it published, but it still makes a good point. So they train uh, physiotherapists, uh, uh, physiotherapists or uh, PT um, people to, to pick up psoriatic arthritis. So they had the rheumatologist say, hey, that the patient did not have PSA, possible PSA, a definite psoriatic arthritis. And then everybody had an ultrasound. Uh, I did a, a 1,100 patients were invited, about 100 did the assessment. And it turns out that the physical therapist was just as good at picking up who had disease as we saw in the ultrasound. It correlated with the topaz. One of the questionnaires has been validated for psoriatic arthritis and elevated C-reactive protein. So it turns out that, hey, you don't need a physician to make that diagnosis. Moving forward, why this is important, guys, look what's being talked about. Congress is already pressuring CMS, Medicare, to cover telehealth services. Not only enough as health care providers, but physical therapists and occupational therapists. So again, the light at the end of this tunnel with the virus, you will see that just like we can do a telephone call and evaluate somebody remotely, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and others will be able to do that, and they will be reimbursed for their time. So again, who needs a physical exam? Uh, this is one of my patients. We tell them, hey, make a fist and show me what you see here. They will ask the question, which of these joints are inflamed? I tell them, hey, you look for that little valley, that little groove of the MCP joints. This one's, look at this. You can see the difference here. My kids could tell you that this a little looks a little different than the others. Now, are there data to back up this when we talk about the physical exam? Indeed, there are. So a very nice article that came out last year in the analyst that said, hey, they took somebody who had clinically suspect arthralgia, not osteoarthritis, but really had, they thought, inflammatory disease, symptoms for more than six weeks, but less than one year. And they did an MRI, the MCP joints and the wrist, and they said, what features that they saw on physical exam that correlate with the MRI features? And indeed, they saw if a patient could not make a fist or they had a decreased grip, that correlated with tenosynovitis. And the one thing they saw, that they followed those patients uh, longer than a year, and many people went on to develop full-blown rheumatoid arthritis. And again, the, the incomplete ability, incomplete fist uh, closure was the one that was predictive of making uh, a RA development. So again, on the physical exam, the patient could not make a fist according to MRI changes, and those people who could not do that, indeed, went on to develop rheumatoid arthritis. So there are things that are out there that's being tweaked as well. Moving forward, we still need some other tools. We talk about what tools can we use as physicians uh, to in, in lieu of a, a hands-on exam. So what can help me do my virtual exam? This is an article from New England Journal last year. They say, we all have these smart devices. Everybody has a smartphone. We have the, the, okay, the Fitbit. We have the iWatch. There's another device out called BioFit. I didn't pick the slide here, but they also have a, a, a smart ring that's out. You can look at your emails. You can get John Tracens and things like that from there. 
And then they have these smart sensors. This is a little sensor that you swallow. It's a little bit bigger than a, a, a capsule, and it correlates and sends a signal to a patch on the, on the surface of the skin. Then that can be transmitted to the cell phone or to the computer, and then all the stuff is fed into electronic records where a physician, a nurse, or somebody's monitoring that data. Hey, the DAS score comes back elevated, or the CRP comes back elevated, or alert goes out, and that triggers some intervention um, by the healthcare provider. Um, last year at the ACR, as I went around looking at posters, we met a group from Germany, and they have telemedicine there, and they've taken it a step further. That is a rheumatologist in Germany, hey, I want to do, um, monitor my patient at home virtually. They can write a prescription for a virtual medical kit at home. And what does that look like? A digital stethoscope here. You can see this um, gentleman has an echo device that he puts over his heart. Um, they can look at the training. I'm using my clinic on a daily, daily basis. A digital thermometer, a young lady taking a temperature, it goes through the device here on the iPhone, and that can be fed to the physician. Uh, we tell all of our patients on the biology drugs, hey, before you do your injection, can you check your temperature? And if it's above a certain threshold, let us know. The same thing can be done with the COVID crisis. At home, if somebody has a temperature, that gets fed to a center to say, hey, your temperature is over 104, 100.4, then, hey, you might need to be seen or somebody calls them and say, what other symptoms are they having? A digital uh, sigma manometer, kind of look at these things, look at the blood pressure levels and see. The glucometer, I think many of you have seen these, a little device a patient puts on their skin. It can measure the blood sugar levels without them having to do a finger puncture. The smart scale, this is one I have, one called Renfo. It not only measures my weight, I do my weight twice a day, but my BMI, my present body protein, it tells me all these different things and that can be fed to an app on my phone and I can download that and do other things. Then I was trying to say, hey, what things are out there? What tools are out there for rheumatology? Not a lot. We need to develop some. There are a couple of things, a dolorometer or algometer that looks at pressure. We talked about putting enough pressure to move four kilograms per um, pound uh, per square inch. Uh, we're looking at that to see. This is some devices that have been out there, and they are available. The, the uh, occupational therapists use this, for example, when they do an, uh, a functional assessment on our patients. So think about this, that you'll be able to order a virtual home kit for your patients to be able to monitor them and they have followed their symptoms down the road. Uh, some of you have multiple clinics. You might have an MA at a clinic one day, a patient calls in and say, hey, I have a sore in my throat or, or my ear or uh, uh, my mouth, what do we look at? Here's a medical device called the Oris. It's used to look at the ears and the nose, but they have an attachment that can go on for looking in for the eyes as well. Uh, I thought about this, I'll say all my patients on methotrexate, I say, if you get a, a sore in your mouth, let me know, but I can't see that. With this device, I can not only look into the ear, here's a mother looking at the ear, and that is fed into a physician who can look at that. So if I got somebody who's on methotrexate, they might have stomatitis. I have a young lady who might, I think, hey, is she having a flare of her Bichette's disease? If I have a lady with lupus who has an ulcer in her nose, let me take a look at that to see if that's coming from the lupus ulcer. And again, you think this is Star Trek. Let's take it a step further. Again, we can look at this to monitor skin lesions. Many of our drugs, like the TNF drugs, the JAK inhibitors, they say that the patients need to do a periodic skin exam. Sometimes the dermatologists push back. They don't like to do these patients, but hey, I can take a picture of these lesions that I suspected, and I can send that to my dermatologist and have them look at it. He says, nothing to worry about. Or come in, let me do a biopsy, or let me freeze that off. So several devices out there, one called the Moleskope, a little cautionary warning, I was reading something in JAMA just today uh, that the FDA, none of these devices, several devices on the market are not FDA approved and some have been banned to be used in the US because they're making false claims. And this reason just kind of blew me away. Think about this guys, uh, immediate access to care. So say you have a, a sore throat, a, a, a earache, you can go online, do something called Odo Home and you can click on the button. And then you can get this otoscope that's sent to you. Uh, here's ET taken off and bringing it home. And if that the image is sent to a physician, they think you have a middle ear infection, they can get antibiotic. And it is again guaranteed this from one to three, this is happens within three hours. If you don't have it and been connected with your doctor within three hours, you don't have to pay. So think about that for a patient with rheumatoid arthritis. Think about that with a patient with gout who's having a flare. Can I see that patient today? Can I do it immediately? and all those different things. I'll tell you how we manage it in our clinic as well. But this is where it is. So moving forward, telemedicine is here to stay. We need to get devices to help us to monitor our patients with rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory diseases. And some of these things are in development as we speak. As you know, with this year, um, the things that changed with the COVID crisis and on March 17, Sigma Verma from CMS said, hey, moving forward, that we change the points of care. 
So one of the challenges I had before um, this crisis came up, I would uh, could only see patients to get reimbursed from it when I did it from their, um, from a hospital to my clinic or from a nursing home to my clinic. Fast forward after March 17th, they've changed it. They say, thank you, new, you can do home to provider. So here I am sitting at my desktop and I could connect with a patient at their home and you get reimbursed for that. And that's why they changed all those different things. I don't think this will change going for, uh, moving forward. I think this will be something that we'll still see coming up in place. A cautionary warning as you move forward telemedicine, I debated uh, Orrin Traum at uh, RWCS in Maui this year, and he came up with some of these things that you still need to know the regulations. That, hey, I'm in Illinois and Wisconsin. I still need to say, hey, can I indeed see a patient from Montana? I have a Montana license. Can I dig indeed see a patient from South Dakota with my South Dakota license? So you need to know your regulations in your, in your, in your, in your, your site of care. And part of that regulation is going to be with the malpractice. So look at your malpractice uh, carrier, look at that and see what kind of um, rider they have and then we're doing remote visits. Reimbursements, I'll share a little letter in a minute, but I think the reimbursements are here to stay. They probably will not be the same as an office visit but they won't be down here where nothing is going to be a thing. They're the American College of Physicians, again, not only for a new patient, an established patient, but also for new. We're still going to have to deal with the licensure. I have five medical licenses. I thought I was doing good until I met an ophthalmologist last week who had 15 medical licenses in 15 different states. So I work with um, the Federation of State Medical Boards to say, hey, can I treat patients if my licenses that I have will that kind of uh, carry me to other states here? because that was one thing that changed with the COVID crisis as well. They say, hey, now you can see patients across state lines because they can't get in to see somebody in Texas that indeed that doctor in Florida or Louisiana can see that patient connect with them remotely, prescribe, order drugs, order labs, et cetera. And that's what's gonna change. When I talk about reimbursement, look at the efforts coming from the American College of Physicians. I'm a member of that as well. So on April 8th, the American College of Physicians sent out a letter to Seema Verma. And it essentially says here that we don't wanna go back that indeed as we do in our office visits and telephone calls that it should be uh, and reimbursed at the same rate. And again, they wanted for immediate guidance on this as well. And again, you look at all the different colleges and organizations that were signed off on this, here you see the American College of Rheumatology as well. There's a whole force behind this that said, and indeed, if I see a patient in real time in an office visit, if I connect with that patient and still spend 15 minutes on the telephone or by way of the video, I still should be reimbursed for my time and their aggressive efforts with that. And like I showed you earlier, not only for us as physicians, but it's gonna be the same thing for physical therapists and others as well. So moving forward, this is a slide I saw, a white paper that came out, it's on the um, healthit.gov site. And I'll say so at the end of the uh, presentation, I have some resources for you. You can make a screenshot of those to kind of share with you. But moving forward, these are gonna be whether we talk about an integrated care or fractured care. Here's one thing I'll tease you with, guys. You're gonna see rheumatologists play more of a role as a primary care doctor. That indeed, if I put a patient on a biologic drug that might make the cholesterol go up, I might have to be able to manage that. Indeed, if I put a patient on a drug that might make them have inflammatory bowel disease, I need to make that referral to a gastroenterologist and help to manage that care. So we will not be relying on the primary care doctor in many of our cases. It's gonna be us serving the role as a primary care doctor. We still need to be telehealth enabled. We need to have this extended integration. But if you're outside of this, this is where you're going to get into issues because we won't be to crosstalk and the patient's going to be disjointed. And you're going to see this. So this is an interesting white paper to brought up that concept. And as we talk about moving forward, there's a new normal. Be ready for it. My, now my stethoscope is the, the iPhone or my iPad or my desktop where I can prescribe, uh, I can do evaluation to patient virtually. I can get blood work order, I can get other labs, I can do the records, and then I can do their um, medications. Not only from the hospital, from a nursing home, but now from their, their home. And that's where the new normal will be. The caveat rheumatoid, I use the term caveat mTOR, caveat rheumatoid, so let the rheumatologists beware. Uh, CMS came out with some guidelines saying, hey, everybody scramble to come up with something. Can I use Facebook? Can I use uh, FaceTime to kind of get connected? Because I haven't done anything with telemedicine. The answer is no, you can't. Some of these things are not HIPAA compliant, like Facebook Live, Twitch, and TikTok. Uh, you gotta be very careful. Uh, they did sort out a list of vendors, and these are just not the whole list, but they say these are the ones that are H HIPAA compliant. Uh, like we say, many people are using DoxyMe. They have a free service. They have ones you can pay for. I mentioned others are not here. For example, HealthTap, American Well, and many of these things you wanna make sure, hey, do I need to go into a BAA? So a business agreement, uh, a, a business association agreement. 
So they signed off, they're HIPAA protected, so there will not be any violations by you or by them as you're doing these things. So make sure that the, that the, the a vendor that you're using is one of these is HIPAA compliant. And again, I'll give you the website where the CMS is put out that we can kind of follow those along. Here is my setup and many of you talked about, so now we use Zoom Healthcare. Uh, so Zoom, the patient can sign up and get logged into Zoom, here I am. In my office, I have the screen, I just, just mock up to show you back behind me. I usually would have that so you can't see my office and my window back behind, something counts uh, web around. You can see that it looks like I'm in a studio. Well, let me give you an example of what we do for our patients. Uh, also, again, for the AMA on that website, again, this is a moving target. This was just updated a few weeks ago to say, hey, if I'm seeing patients who have suspect COVID or non-COVID, what kind of interactions am I have? So the patient here, if I get a telephone call or I connect with them by audio visual like we are now and I do my evaluation, these are the codes and the times that we use. If my nurse calls them, if my medical assistant checks in with them, why is that important? Remember that one step forward slide I showed you for the EMA, it says about chronic care management. And you can get reimbursed for connecting with that patient once a month and say, hey, are you taking your biologic drug? Or you have any knowledge on your methotrexate? You document that and you can get reimbursed for that. We do talk about you have to use the codes and all the, the things like that we talk about, so the, the modifiers. Let me go to the next slide that kind of goes you through. On this AMA website, they go through like 19 different scenarios to tell you what, you, what we're looking for. So again, patient connects with you, you do the exam, uh, talk about them, uh, evaluation by telephone or remote uh, by video, and these are things you wanna look for. A lot of it is time-based. I tell people in my first, you gotta make sure you have at the top of them I visit, hey, I've got the consent that in lieu of a physical exam, I'm actually a patient's consent to let me do a virtual evaluation, uh, that I've identified who that patient is, that they're in one of the states where I have a license, a legal authority to practice. That's my first kind of the smart phrase or whatever you want to put at the top of my note. And then everything else kind of flows from there. Uh, I talk about, hey, I do a, a mental exam. If a patient's alert and oriented, they know it's me. Um, I do a look in their mouth. I look at their skin. I do the joints. I'm reviewing labs. And God forbid, I give a med draw dose pack, it's almost like a level four visit. So you can put your standard codes on, document the time, and down here tells you the modifiers you want to use. And remember that most insurance companies will go along with the CMS or the Medicare guy, uh, modifiers and codes, but you might want to check with your individual payers. They might require other things, but most of them are following suit. Just like I showed you coming from the American College of Physicians, that letters have been sent out, they're doing that for all the other carriers. And many people like this year, like uh, Edna, have already taken a vote, say, hey, we're covering it full stream. You document a level three, a level four exam, we will reimburse just like you were seeing that patient in live time. Pay attention to these, because like I said the target is moving, and every week or every other week, these things are being updated on the websites. So let me give you a scenario. Uh, this came out by a group called bright.me, thinking about an algorithm. And this is one of the things our patient, I think even heard Jack complaining about at RWCS, say, hey, I hate Epic, I spend more time hitting the buttons on the keys than doing the patient. So a patient calls in, it's this the example is, hey, somebody got some respiratory symptoms, or it could be a rheumatoid or a gout flare. Uh, they call in for a 15 or 20 minute appointment. Most of my time is spent documenting stuff on electronic medical records. I gotta hit the right buttons and be billed for it and do all those different things. And this is where we were before COVID. After COVID and moving forward here, you'll see systems that have come up on this company's title and say, hey, the patient calls and come, logs in, they put in their top symptoms, I'm having pain, I'm having stiffness in the morning, I have a fever, whatever, it, and that the computer gives me an algorithm. Hey, this could be a gal flare. Hey, this could be rheumatoid arthritis. And now, I, uh, they only takes two minutes of my time on electronic records where I can focus on my intervention. So moving forward, you're gonna see more of this kind of uh, artificial intelligence being done to help us kind of tweak out. It might say, come back and say, hey, this is nothing. This is your chronic back pain. You need to call your PMR uh, physician. So I'll give you some scenarios. Going back to that saying, so which patient needs to get an exam? So I got a patient, she calls me up. Hey, Dr. Wells, I got these lesions on my skin. I don't do that over the phone. Uh, we can say, hey, let's send me some images. We can look at that and we can connect live. So in a typical 15 minute visit, three minutes of my time going through stuff, what's your issues? I have a patient already, my MA checks them in, write down the one or two things they want to discuss. Hey, I have some redness on my eye. I got these sores on my neck, swollen of my joints, what's going on? If they have rheumatoid arthritis, I'm doing a rapid three. We talk about the health assessment questionnaire. I do a visual inspection like we talked about, I'm not gonna talk about the prayer sign, can they move the arms, moving the arm out to the side, to suspecting uh, rotator cuff, cuff disease. And before the visit even, they have skin stuff, they can submit pictures. 
So that goes in and my MAs are pulling that up already. So getting those visits teed up for me already. I do this evaluation. I say, hey, I think this could be your discord lupus. Let me talk about what we want to do, relay that plan. Hey, this could be uveitis flare. I'm gonna call in a Madrol dose pack. I need you to come in for a sample injection of a biologic and get you started. You recap that and summarize and you do your note and then you move on to the next patient. Do I need to see these people or can I do this stuff remotely? If you can't get them in, they can't wait three or four weeks to take care of these things. They can get it under control. Now here's the one I really would tease you with. Do I need to lay hands on this patient before I make the diagnosis? He's got the skin disease. He's got some dactylitis. He's got the nail dystrophic changes. I order my x-ray to show that he has arthritis mutilans here. This is psoriatic arthritis. I can do this in my sleep. The same thing, give him our three assessment. I got a lot of skin disease. They got joint disease. This guy was a construction worker. He couldn't even put his boots on. I say, talk about what we need to do. And we're gonna start your own drug for right now. I don't need to wait on the quantiferon. I'll get my blood work done. I'll get the results back tomorrow. If I see any issues, I'll let you know. Relay the plan and then summarize. This might be somebody you wanna see back in a week or two. This might be somebody you wanna see in the office the next day. So again, using these virtual visits to make that documentation and kind of follow those patients along. There are some caveats, and I give kudos to talk about here. Again, we talk about the benefits and potential harm. One of the things we're finding, and this is one thing, again, another uh, 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 silver lining in the cloud is COVID virus, is that we're seeing that, unfortunately, not all of our patients, like the students in Chicago say, hey, go home, do your e-learning, but they found out that 300,000 kids have no internet access and they have no laptops at home. So we're finding out that, hey, even though I want to do all the stuff and I'm do, talking about my, uh, what we are moving forward, many patients are not willing or unable to track themselves. They don't want to be involved. They might do a telephone call, but they don't want to have any of this other business with the stuff that I'm talking about tonight. So again, you need to know those patients and then you got to talk about, hey, we can stratify which ones need to be seen and how do you do those moving forward. I like telerheumatology because I never run behind. The patient pays for 15 minutes, that's what they get. I get a five minute warning, a two minute warning, and then the link is cut. They want 30 minutes, they pay for 30 minutes. Uh, it allows me for more frequent, effective follow-up. I say, hey, this is what we're gonna do. Connect with me in two weeks. I'm gonna take some repeat images. Let me see those scan lesions. So you can increase consults. I got some groups that, you know, my colleagues says, hey, yeah, I know I go through all these records, I review them, and I say, no, I'm not gonna see them. You don't get paid for that time. Why not review them virtually? Hey, based on this and this, oh, you got back pain for seven years. Oh, you got an A and A of one to 40. That's not lupus. Good news, Mrs. Smith, you don't need to see me. So don't say no to those things. Evaluate those patients. Give them due diligence like you talked about, but not everybody needs to be seen. So you can do more oriented uh, problems. I make the analogy, you just send a patient to the surgeon. Hey, to look at the patient got some right shoulder pain. Look at the shoulder. And before the patient leaves the orthopedic's office, he said, okay, by the way, uh, Dr. Uh, Smith, I have some knee pain. They said, whoa, 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 my partner's a knee doctor. You need to see the, the, the knee doctor. So again, we need to be more surgical. Somebody comes in with gout, I don't need to be looking in their nose and mouth for gout. It's, it's mostly in their <laughs> the ankle and their toes. Somebody comes in with lupus, back pain doesn't cause lupus. You know, we think about that, you can do all those different things. Uh, the savings on the patient side is time of travel. Many of you are dealing with patients like me coming in for a distance. They come one or two hours away. But think about if you're in Los Angeles, or you're downtown Chicago, Atlanta. A patient got to leave their office or home, get in six lanes of traffic. God forbid it's a traffic accident. You know, then they're delayed. Uh, you get more effective and frequent visits because they, I, they get right to the point. It's not going on for 30 minutes and talk about this and crying about all these other things. They really get focused. Uh, they don't have to go off and work. Somebody's at work. They go in the office and close the door. They can connect with me. And one of the things we learned too, hey, well, a lady, she's got kids at home. Uh, she's got to worry about, got two kids. One kid is sick. What is she going to do with the other? Like many of you, my patients, they bring the whole family to y'all. They got six kids and the grandparents in my the examining room. Uh, but again, it, this is where telemedicine comes in. All right, so moving forward, again, I adopted some things from the AMA's things, looking at steps forward, so adopting telemedicine. Um, some resources out there, I've been talking about all night, the CMS, so you look at that website, cms.gov. If you click on the Medicare button, you drop down telehealth here, and it has a list of all the covered telehealth services. You get the codes, you get the diagnoses here, and I just downloaded this, and this was diagnosed, updated on March 30th. So pay attention to that. If you have questions about billing and things like that, it is all there. Don't recreate the wheel. I can't stress enough, when I, in 2004, when I started doing ultrasound, I came back after spending a week in Paris and came back, I said, I'm gonna join the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine. 
And as a result of that, I learned so much about ultrasound that I see in the different journals, going to the meetings, see what what's going on in that arena. The same thing about telemedicine, that if you're going to be serious about this, you need to be, I'm reading this journal every month, the telemedicine and e-health, a nice article this, uh, this month in the, uh, the journal that from a group from Iran that talks about how they're doing telemedicine in Iran. So join the American Telemedicine Association. You get access to all this stuff. All these different tools I learned, your devices to monitor things. I learned about that this year at the meeting. So that's what we recommend doing. So moving forward, and again, this is what I think being provocative, I think what we need to do, we need to develop a, a, a virtual physical examinations. I know we all, was it Bates, the examination book we had as a, the second year of medical school we looked at, that we need to begin to teach this in the medical schools, okay? And not only for us as physicians, but they need to incorporate into the schools for the APCs, nurse practitioners and physician assistants. So developing a physical exam. We need to develop virtual clinics. So we talk about my practice, okay? Talk about your practice, but it needs to be done in residency. Yeah, they have the hospital visits, they got the outpatient clinic, but they need to be done and now so doing a, a virtual clinic as well, doing residency and fellowship. So again, you had the attendant, you got the, uh, the, the fellow in a room, they all get together, they connect with Mrs. Smith, the attendant's sitting in the corner while the, re the fellow, the resident does the exam, and then the attendant comes around and get onto the camera just to verify some things and done. That needs to start in doing residency. And then virtual meetings, I think that's gonna become the rule and not the exception. I think kudos to what Jack has done. This year at Room Now Live, only about 25 or 30 people were there physically, but you had a lot of people there virtually from around the world. Uh, a ULAR meeting this year is going to be a virtual meeting. The American Telemedicine Association meeting is supposed to be the first week of May. It's actually gone virtual. So virtual meetings will become the rule and not the exception. So moving forward, did we talk about the four steps to adapt telemedicine in your office. You need to know the regulations. You need to know your service model. I talk about that. The licensure, know about your malpractice, all those things come in there. Determine your technology and support. So those vendors that you're using, Doxy Me, does it come with some support? If I'm in the middle of an evaluation and I lose a connection or something goes wrong on my end or the patient end, you know, am I still able to bill for that? All those different things need to be specified up front. And I talk about the HIPAA laws, guys, be very cautious out there, making sure you got your BAA uh, in, in, in place with your vendors and understand the appropriate practice guidelines as you go through these things. So again, as we talk about this, I think telemedicine, telerheumatology, this is becoming the standard of care. And I think the good news after this is that I think this will be able to say, we do need to improve, talk about, hey, how we improve patient care. It's just not out there for me to make more money to see more patients. I got to show that I'm doing something. We will become up with other ways to virtually monitor our patients. I showed you all these devices. We haven't found the ideal thing for rheumatology yet. Uh, it's being used in ophthalmology and other areas as well. We need to know now the reimbursement and malpractice coverage, all those things are being worked out by AC, AMA, ACP, and all those others. I tell you, it's here to stay and don't go backwards. Here's one scenario I tell you, say if you're in a group of three or four doctors, it might not be the 80 year old guy who's working a half day a week seeing five patients. It's gonna be the younger doctor that you put in charge. Hey, I want you to become a member of the HEA. I want you to go to the meeting every year and bring back the resources to help me do my job. So designate the key staff. Have the one EMA who's gonna set up your virtual calls and get people set in. So when they log in to see if the images are there, their refills are already set up, you click off and you got that 15 minutes, you're off and running. Because uh, I tell you, if you don't have a digital strategy in 2020, you don't have a healthcare strategy. So those are things I want to share with you. Again, this is why I say, hey, take a screenshot of this slide because it gives you all the resources and everything out there. I try to be evidence-based when I do my presentations. I have uh, resources at the, uh, and uh, references at the bottom of each slide and just give you where I pull most of these data from and of course, some of my own experience. So with that, Jack, I'll end on this. I like the TNR here, Tuesday Night Rheumatology. Why don't I end there and turn that back over to you for some time some questions and answers. Alvin, thank you a bunch for a, a, a great review again on a very important subject. Um, I just want to flash this up so everyone can uh, think about next week as well. Artie Cavanaugh is going to give us Journal Club a great article uh, in the last few months from Annals of Rheumatic Disease on the withdrawal of low-dose prednisone in SLE patients and what does that do to outcomes in SLE it's a very interesting article, and I think that uh, it will generate a lot, of, a lot of discussion going forward. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some Q&A. Um, Alvin, thank you for that. You know, thank there's you. so many places to begin. Uh, I'm going to begin with a um, um, recent statement from the president of the ACP, American College of Physicians, who said telehealth delivered remotely is essential to patient care during this public health crisis. 
that's really where we are. You know, I think that um, uh, many of us have gotten better at this in the last few weeks. What kind of maturation have you seen in your colleagues in the last month? I tell you that this, it, the learning curve has been uh, uh, steep, but people have kind of hurled that. I go back, Jack, remember we were all threading, uh, uh, dreading the use of ICD-10, and now we can know these codes in our heads, right? And that's what many people, they were actually forced to kind of get there uh, because they had no other option. Uh, patients, uh, the, uh, physicians had the groups, the practice was closed, they're not having any revenue, patients are calling in, they're needing their refills, they got all these different things, so we've seen that as well. There have been some glitches and there will be, even I still have some too as well, okay? How do I connect that patient who doesn't have the internet access? Uh, we're talking about maybe get them to go to the libraries to get it into a cubicle, but the libraries are closed. So we talk about what do we need to do? So there's gonna be a learning curve and that's why I say connecting with these meetings, now that ATA meeting, like I said, is gonna be virtual. You can go in and learn all these different things about updates, about new devices and new, new tools and that's gonna be really key. So I want to be, before we get into a bunch of questions, which are starting to pile up, if you have any questions, go to the Q&A section and enter your question there. Uh, we'll try to get to all of them in the next half hour. Um, I want to do a sort of checklist, a sort of a workflow, if you will, for the telehealth visit. So um, patients are contacted ahead of time by my staff. I'm sure you do the same to schedule yeah. it. Um, and whether you're going to do a tele uh, phone call, whether you're going to do a tele video call within an EMR or within an application like you're using. Um, so it's scheduled and then you have a time. I like what you said that, um, you know, you're on time and you're, everybody pays for the time that they get and that's how you should do your billing. Um, do you begin your visit with obtaining consent and permission? No, my MAs do that. So okay. when my, my, they call the MAs do this, say, hey, first they document that they are, or just review, give them, tell me your birthday. They don't go ask for social security numbers and things like that but they do the consent for me. And I confirm that, that I've done the consent as well. They do their refills and ask other questions. What are the two things you wanna talk about today? So my MAs do some work already. And while I'm on the phone with one patient, my one o'clock to 115, she's already teeing up the 115 to 130 patient. So they got these people in the queue and kind of going through that. It makes it very, very nice to do. Okay, so a lot of our docs are doing telephone calls. Um, I don't know if they know, they can use the, the Doxy Me to use the dialer there so they don't have to let their cell phones out there or their home phones out there. You can also, if you are using your cell phone, you can do a star 67 and dial the patient's number and it comes up as a private number so your information is kept private. Um, you're not doing telephone visits pretty much. Are you doing almost all of them tele video visits or, or how do you mix them? So now I would say about 75% of mine are all done uh, with the video. Again, some of my older patients who don't have internet access at home or don't have a laptop, it's gonna be a telephone call. And Jack, I'll also tell you too, so on Do Doxy, uh, Doximity, you have an app here, you can do a video, but I don't know if that's HIPAA protected. So you can do a virtual a video call or block your number from your cell phone using Doximity. So um, one of the problems I encounter using, um, uh, doing video inside of Epic is a screen issue. Uh, and sharing the screen. So I have my documentation screen up and then when I want to look at the patient video, it's behind it. So when I'm at home and I have a two screen, a two screen setup, it's beautiful. When I have a one screen setup, um, it may help to, do, to have a separate screen. Windows can figure that out for you or to use your cell phone and on a tripod. And, and if you're doing calls by yes. um, using your cell phone, whether it's on Zoom or in WhatsApp or FaceTime or whatever, you can use this as your second screen. Um, how do you handle a, a second screen issue? And Jack, I'm the exact opposite. So at work, I have a very nice setup, a large monitor, and I have a second one that I use for looking at my x-rays. But now that's what I have. I can see the patient here and I got my other nice big screen to look at my epic chart. At home, even though I got a, like a 17 inch laptop, I'm a little short, short changed. So I've actually submitted the question to the Epic team and to the people at Zoom, is it a way I can anchor that picture? I just need a little box in there to kind of see them as I'm typing there. So at home, until this crisis is over, when I'm back in the clinic, I have my little laptop where I can see it. But at work, I just like you, I have the two different screens where we can look at things as well. I like the idea about having my phone to do that as my Zoom and I can then look at stuff on Epic. So that might be something I try. I got, I got the tripod thanks to your recommendation. <laughs> yeah, it, it, the, having a separate tripod makes it, it's, just makes it work really well. It seems like from your presentation, time is the essential issue here and time drives coding. Is that what you, would you, can you restate that? A hundred percent. So the two things that you have to get for CMS, you got to do the consent and you have to document your time. 
because it's all based on that. If you spend 20 or 30 minutes on the time, write that down, document, hey, I've been on for 30 minutes and this is what we did. So time is money and that's what we're finding now now. And this is why the push here is say, if you spend 20 minutes on the phone with somebody, you should be able to bill for that at the same level that you're doing. And that's why the push for the ACP is not to go back. Right, so um, the coding that I'm using is um, for phone calls, it's 99442 and 443, 443 for that 20 to 30 minute mm -hmm. telephone call. Um, and then everything else that I do by televideo is in the same codes that I would use otherwise, 99214, 99215, 99204 for the new, new patient visits. So I think that that's really helpful. Trying to get into too many codes gets a little too confusing for us that are just starting out. You know, when I looked at a lot of the questions, it seems like one of the most important, one of the most common questions to begin with is how comfortable are you at doing a televideo visit on a new patient? Are you comfortable doing that or, or do you only do face to face? How do, again, new patients, what do you do? So, like I said, I've been doing telemedicine for almost six years. And before this crisis, I would only see my uh, follow-up patient by way of uh, video. But now I've been seeing like today I had two, I got two more patients tomorrow. And last week I had one, I said, man, why are they even consulting me? A lady had a positive ANA and she didn't know why she, uh, the test was done. Uh, and they call me thinking she had lupus and she didn't have lupus. So I am feel comfortable doing things. So I think about those different things. Think about ankylosing spondylitis, think about psoriatic arthritis. There are a lot of different things where you don't need a physical exam. Cause hey, I connect with you for 15 minutes. Based on this, I suspect this could be whatever my disease. I get my blood work and x-rays. I connect with the next week virtually and say, hey, you need to come in. So that's the thing that we do. So right now, until we get, we're trying to avoid patients coming to actually into the clinic, I'm seeing new people that way doing my workup. I still want to do a hands-on, listen to the heart and lungs, do a lymph node exam, all those different things. But I don't need to do that to get started uh, on things. So I got a question um, uh, here from about what time do you use based on the AMA slide you showed, do you use CMS time or CPT time? So I'm using, the, I'm using the CPT time, just like you said. So I'm spending 15 minutes with, like you said, I'm doing a 99213 for most of my calls and follow-ups. I put down for 15 minutes with that, and that's what I'm doing. So but if I'm doing a telephone call, most of those are lasting 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, those patients really want to go on. And uh, unfortunately, with the telephone call, I can't pull the plug or cut the link like I can with the video. Uh, with the telephone calls, they can go on and on. I have a timer going. I'm looking at that. Okay, now let me summarize. This is what we're going to do, and we're going to go from there. So the telephone calls, be called, be, be careful, because you can't go longer than you want. You're talking about everything. The biggest question I'm getting from my patient on the telephone, they're saying, hey, Dr. Wells, how are you with the virus? You know, you ask about my health, but I really want to focus on them. But no, I'm using CPT code uh, for most of my health visits. So um, one of our um, listeners said, uh, makes the statement that Medicare has proposed paying the same for audio and audio visual visits, is that true? Yes, and that's, that, yes it is, I'm sorry, it's a little lag. Yes, there is, Jack, and that's a letter from the uh, ACP that for telephone and all these other ones, they want to be able to pay the same visit at, uh, cost that it is for, um, that we see them in person. And the reason that is, they don't want all the patients to get sick and have to go to the hospital because that's gonna cost Medicare even more. So can I evaluate them, assess them, and treat them over the phone and, and as opposed to having them come into the clinic? And I don't think we're going to see that change. Like I said, we won't be getting billed as much. It's going to be somewhere in between. And that's one thing that's going to come out of this. You're going to have some patients say, hey, I saw them three months ago. I'm doing a follow-up with somebody with PMR just to make sure she's doing okay on the prednisone and go from there. I don't really need to have her to come into the clinic if she's doing okay. So Dr. Shika Mitu from Toronto says, great talk, Alvin. What applications exist where you can, independent of an EMR, have patients upload images or things for you to use and, and still be secure? Is there something that you would recommend? A very good question. Like I said, be talk with your vendor and make sure they HIPAA protect you. So with Zoom, it is Zoom healthcare. Uh, some issues came up that if patients are doing, uh, people are doing a regular Zoom conference and hey, there's some security issues or people tapping in, they didn't even know it in the background. But the Zoom healthcare um, mo, uh, uh, platform is actually secure. So they said take pictures and they show them there. We actually tell them how to do that. We even on link, there's like a little uh, instruction about how to do those as well. Uh, American Well, Docs and Me, they all have ways that your patient can take, um, take images and those are all protected. I don't want patients that's taking the pictures and emailing those to me. They don't even have access to my email. I don't look at those, but that's one thing to look at. I think what you need to think, what you think about your vendors, many people got a vendor now to get things started, to get over this hump. 
but moving forward, you need to go more to the Cadillac vendor. You need to get something that's going to be all the utility of things that we talked about. So one of our nurse practitioners here in North Texas asked the question, how do you set limits with patients um, <laughs> when doing these kind of visits? She's having uh, visits and the patient's driving and then their phone dies and then they want to go on and on and, and whatnot. So uh, do you have any tips on how to set limits and set rules? I, I tell you, setting the limits is always a challenge still because I got some patients like you. I've had them for years, Jack, and they just want to talk. They want to ask about me and do everything. I say, hey, yeah, I'm doing fine now. We're trying to really got to get to them. You got to keep bringing them back in. So knowing those individuals, but one of the ways I get to help that, I have my medical assistants say, hey, what are the two things you want to talk with me about? They don't have much more time for anything else. I need a refill of my methotrexate. I'm having trouble sleeping. That's what we talk about. If they have a headache, they got the stomach upset, they got constipation, that's going to be the primary care or it's going to be another phone call or another visit. So you really got to up front, I see you want to talk about this. I see you're still having pain despite your treatment and you kind of focus things right there. So know up front when you open up the door, open up the line, what they want to talk about and that way you can kind of hone them in that way. So uh, of all those many tools that we could possibly use remotely, do you think thermography could be one of them? <laughs> So we might see that coming back, Jack. There's some friends, there's a group out of the uh, Germany looking on something called a hand scan, all these different things. I think they'll look at a portable device that you can get to look at things. I mean, there's this glove you can get on Amazon to say, hey, can I have my mobility there to look at all the different stuff there? So I can tell you companies are out there. Uh, when I showed you, hey, a patient can log on and one hour get the device at home and another hour have the, the drugs, it's gonna be through the Amazon delivery systems. Uh, Amazon might even have like a little medical kiosk in their parking lot where you can go there and get see everything. It's just the world is changing very, very rapidly. And I, that's why I tell groups to be involved and be ready and identify that individual who's going to take this by the reins and run with it. So um, Joanna Davies says out in California, she seems to be, seems to be surprised that her insurance um, uh, biller is saying that you can get the same reimbursement for a phone call as you can for a doximity video visit. Is that really your experience? Oh, 100%. And that's why I said the, the, that uh, the rules will loosen up on March 17th. They say, hey, basically, because we don't want people going to the clinic getting sick, instead of that visit, the telephone call will be reimbursed. Now that letter I showed you with all the signatures on there, they say, hey, is, we're reimbursing that way. We don't want to go back. We want to continue to have that in place. But that's 100%. And I verified that with my billing group as well. For the last few weeks, doing that stuff, and for the, you know two weeks, your money for Medicare is into your bank account. And that's what we see. So yes, and but we don't want to go back for that. What we will find that with the insurance companies, Blue Cross, Humana, United, where they go along with what CMS has done. So yes, I mean, that's, that's going to be really huge for us. So Alvin, I think Mark Fisher was thinking what I was thinking when you showed us that time breakdown, of how many minutes you spent on everything. We're wondering, while you're doing three minutes here, four minutes there, five minutes there, three minutes wrap up, who's doing the documentation? How do you handle that? Oh, I am, and Jack, what I'm doing, so I'm doing documentation as I go along, or I have my microphone. That one slide I show you, I'm dictating, I'm talking about stuff. She says, yeah, I have a pain, pain score of five. Oh, yes, that my right wrist, right wrist pain. I'm dictating as I go back and forth, using my, my drag and speak and going to things like that. If you don't do that, I can tell you, since I've been seeing so many people back to back, I, I am kind of a little stressed to kind of get everything done. So that every hour I might have to go back and wrap up a couple of notes, but the goal is to do a couple problems, and be really, really focused. It's not gonna be the detail, you know, two page list that I'm looking at everything for a new consult. It's gonna be very, very fine. Arthralgias, I suspect rheumatoid arthritis, this is my workup. You just go bullet points and go from there. I'm not going on and on like a professorial pref pref dictation about uh, of what we're seeing. So um, is there a cost to um, these services that we're talking about here? You mentioned it, that some of them are for fees, what kind of fees would, would a, a practice, a, let's just say a solo practitioner incur in doing some of these things? Yeah, so you, get what you, you get what you pay for when you, it was right. You get what you pay for for some of these. I'll use American Well, for example, American Well, uh, the, the, you, you, they charge you a fee for what they, uh, you get uh, out of your collection. Um, Doximi, Doxy.me, they have a free service. You can actually go up to the next level, which, I recommend you get more utility doing those things as well. Uh, Health tap, the same type of thing. They charge the patient, it's all cash based. The patient has to pay before coming in. That model is slowly going away. That's why I didn't put it down because these things are being covered by the insurance companies now. So they're all different based on what kind of utility and tools you want to have with them. 
So Doc to me is good, but you need to look at some others. I, I really like American Well. We use that move with that because it couldn't cross talk to Epic. I have to have American Well print that thing out and get it scanned into my chart. So now with Zoom, it goes directly in there. So it, it, it just decreased that step. So play around with that. And another reason to join the ATA, you can go there, all the vendors are there. And thinking about that, so there's something to look at. We've even talked about proposing to the ACR, say, hey, these are three vendors that we buy. Let the ACR buy the license. And as a, a rheumatologist, uh, board certified and a member of the ACR, I can sub-license those in. So all those things are being talked about. We've got to be creative in this new environment. So um, one of our speakers says that, you know, we're developing, we're going into another phase now where the shelter in place may get relaxed, you know, and there may be a return to clinic in, I don't know, probably not May, but certainly by June and, and whatnot. How do you see telehealth going forward, even uh, as we start to transition back to the new normal, whatever that is? Yeah, we will have a new normal. I mean, you're going to have some people who are like the scary cats. Um, I got people, they, they stop taking their meds. They don't care what I told them. I got some people, hey, no, I don't want to come in, uh, in into the uh, clinic because I don't want to be exposed. I can tell you as I go around, I went out yes uh, on Sunday to get gas, Jack, and I'm seeing people with no mask on, no gloves. I mean, people are already beginning to come out and doing things already. So, no, I think that as, even as we see stuff, uh, like I say, many of us, like I, I, on an average day, I'll see 25 patients before COVID. I might still say, hey, let me see half of those or a third of those at, uh, virtually. And if I can get paid with the telephone calls, we'll do that. And I see the other half would really reserve my new patients, acute patients, all those different ones. So the, to come up, whatever's going to work best for your flow and for your office, whether it's going to be new and acute, some of your follow-ups you can do. Like I said, for OA, fibromyalgia, and back pain, I don't really need, they want to come in, they want to talk about pain and stuff like that, but they, you know, what else am I going to do? It really going to make a big difference. So uh, John Goldman in Atlanta asks, uh, how do you get patients to fill out information ahead of time? Do you have a form that you send to them? Do you have an online service? I can tell you that I'm, I'm working on developing this from on room now as a service that your patients can use. And then when they fill it out, it automatically will go to you, the provider, and you can have it in front of you when you see them. And it can all be done ahead of time, but I'm a few weeks away from having that. What are you doing um, in, in, in lieu of something like that? And that's what we really need. And like I said, some patients, that one slide I said, the caveat is not everybody wants to be involved. They don't want to do the self-track and they don't have the access. It's my medical assistant. So we don't do the full hack, but they ask their pain scores. They ask about their overall uh, function and then their, how they are fatigued. So those are three scores I have up front. And in, in reality, I fill that form out every visit. Some patients push back. They don't want to do it at every visit. But my medical assistants, so again, because they're not having the time to take the weight and do the blood pressure and do all those things now, they're taking those times they would do that to ask those three questions, have the patients say what are the two things they want to discuss. So have your medical assistant to kind of do those things before you set that up. So when they say, hey, I get alert on the Epic, it turns it from um, green to yellow, means it's time for me to go in. I see that it turns to yellow. I can contact the patient on the phone or I can connect, connect with them on the video. That means they've done their work and they already had the refills there. I go in, I click off, yes, their methotrexate, their folic acid, and boom, it goes to the pharmacy. So they've done all that stuff, just like they were, they were rooming the patient. So no, my medical assistants do that. I don't send out a form to people. Cause I tell you the big challenge we need to do is talk about how we have internet access. And is it I, I, like Obama and others say it should be free. And that's what medicine is gonna be delivered now. So it should be free as we talk about how we can provide care to everybody. So we have a question about um, centers that have fellows and how are fellows using um, tele telehealth and telemedicine. I can tell you at my center, where we get a bunch of fellows, the fellows are way ahead of the faculty on, on using the technology and are actually teaching the technology um, in many instances to the faculty. So it's really, uh, it's a partnership, but what's your experience been with uh, training centers who and fellows who are using telehealth? And that's where I think that we really need to begin to grow. So using now our, our, our physicians and learning. So residents and fellows is like as well. Like I said, the analogy would be here, their attendants over there reading a journal article while the fellow is talking to the patient on the phone or video, and then the attendant gets up and verify what they want to do and go back. So you're gonna see that kind of scenario. I think they have to be together the real time. I gotta see on my thing, can we do like a three-way that we got here? Can I see them, the patient, the fellow, and myself? Can I do that virtually? Or do I need to be physically there for billing and purposes and things like that? So all those things need to be worked out. I can tell you that medical schools are to begin to do that now. 
uh, they are doing just like they're teaching second year students uh, uh, ultrasound. They're re already going into telemedicine. How can you use these devices? Hey, here's a tracing. You look at the hard. Here's what you're looking at from there. But this is something that we need to develop and move along, and definitely for rheumatology. So, Dr. Von Felt asked the question about less um, educated patients. You know, is telehealth, telemedicine sort of um, best uh, a best fit for people who are computer adept and have technology and not afraid of these kind of things and uh, are patients um, who may not have the, those skills or that th that facileness with with technology are they going to be handicapped or is this going to be a, a time and education thing so and that's another thing as a society we got to address I'll put a little, a little spin on that as well so what about the patient whose English is not their first language so now with Zoom and Epic, I can connect with a, a virtual translator or interpreter who can go through things with me as well. So now we've seen that. So with some of my older patients, I say if they don't even have a smartphone, like my mother in South Carolina, she doesn't have the internet access. She doesn't have a laptop. She's the old, the old cable. There's no voice over internet. Um, so we said, hey, have a grandson or somebody take you to the library where you can connect and get on. Have somebody to show you how to develop that app or get it up on your phone. Now the old iPhones, iPhone 3 or 4, $99. Um, I would love to see like we do in Germany when I write for that script, I should be covered by the insurance. So a virtual kit, that might be that smartphone going home and they can have somebody walk them through that. Just like we have patients come in, they have their wife come in with it because, you know, unfortunately they don't read, they don't understand, hey, I'm taking that purple pill. We don't know what that is. Uh, and they're ashamed to tell you that. So you need to say, if they don't feel comfortable, that's where the telephone call comes in. And that's why the push is for us to get paid when we do a telephone call because not everybody has internet access and not everybody is not gonna be um, in, uh, uh, instrument savvy. They're not gonna know how to use these tools. So I, I guess I wanna end with someone who's not quite so happy. Um, <laughs> okay. And uh, this uh, um, anonymous uh, person says, what happened to the patient physician relationship? This screwed up relationship is on the basis, uh, is, is the base uh, this sacred relationship is the basis of our vocation as physicians. Are we technicians only? What about the importance of touch and medicine? Are we disintegrating into auto automatons? Will physicians become extinct? I think he goes on and on and on. He's really unhappy with the current situation. It's a crisis, buddy. Get over it. I mean, you got to adapt. Now, you not you know, telemedicine may not be for everybody in the future, but I think that telemedicine is going to be one of the things that will have happened during this crisis that might change the way we practice. And maybe not for everybody, maybe not for this person who's kind of unhappy with their current situation. But for a lot of us, this could change the way we practice and not, and without, as you pointed out, without detriment to the patient or even the relationship. What do you think about, is there gonna be a lost relationship with this? No, I, I do not think so. And again, I've heard that sentiment as well. I think the, the opposite. I can't tell you how grateful my patients have been Oh, Dr. Wells, thank you for the phone call. I know you're thinking about me, all those different things. A couple of phone, uh, minutes on the phone, I'm reminding them to wash their face and their hands. I'm doing all those different things. I'm telling them, hey, Mrs. Smith, we got this crisis going on, but I still want to see you in the clinic. Can you come in in four months? You know, if you have anything in between that, you can let me know. So it doesn't mean, hey, I'm just doing this virtual visit. I'm never going to touch a patient again. That's not the impression, the impression I want to leave, that you still need to see patients, that you will still need to do the physical exam. I'm still going to interact with them. How often do I need to do that? I use fibromyalgia as a good example, not to pick on that disease, but I'm seeing that they want to come in every other week, but what intervention am I going to do? On the other hand, I got somebody who's got uveitis. I need to see them, making sure their eyes are under control. I need to make sure to gout and all those different things. So no, there's not going to be say, hey, I'm just going to do computer stuff in life. We still need to see these patients. And I agree with you, Jack. We need to adapt and we need to use this stuff won't be every patient, but some patient where it's going to be appropriate, I think that's going to be the future. I want to end with a question from Melanie Barron about um, you're seeing a patient by televideo and the connection drops and you have to complete the call by phone. Um, a, does that how often does that happen to you? And B, which do you bill it as? Yeah, with the default terms in the past, and when I was doing charging people, I said, hey, I won't even give you a bill for that. But now with the default is, hey, if I lose the video connection like we do here, my internet's been slow, my wife's a teacher, she's downstairs teaching her class, I'm doing this presentation. If I lose this, I would, the default is going to be a telephone call. Because the caveat is you're still getting paid at that same level. 
There's going to be some pushback. They're going to say, hey, we got billions of dollars for spending. So it's going to be somewhere in between that. It's not going to be zero. It's not going to be the same amount, but it's going to be somewhere in between. So you're still going to be reimbursed for that. So if I lose the internet connection, even if it's on for 10 minutes, I lose it for the last five minutes, I charge it a telephone call. Alvin, a number of our uh, attendees would like to get some of your resources. Could you make a few of these available as slides that we can put up on the website and people Absolutely. can download? Absolutely. That's why I put that there. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know many of you too can come, but yeah, Jack, I'll, I'll have you to reach out to and let me know how to do that. I'm happy you can make all those available for you. Okay. I want to thank my, my good friend, Professor Alvin Wells, for really a, and another informative hour. Um, you can find all of Alvin's content either wherever you listen to our podcast or on our YouTube channel or on our website. We got a lot, bunch of Alvin content and this is going to add to it. Next week, Artie Kavanaugh on doing a journal club on uh, withdrawing steroids and lupus. We want to thank everyone for their participation. We'll see you next week on Tuesday Night Rheumatology. Great. Thank you all very much. Thank you.